Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming on and joining us on a wonderful Sunday. We are here to discuss the psychology of the Legend of Zelda. And one of the greatest things is this is the book cover that we have out currently now that came out about a month ago. And who I have here are some wonderful authors that are on the book as well. So one of the big things we're here to discuss is the different psychological impacts of the game itself and why it has been drawing so many different people and how it continuously wants to be played, I guess is the easiest way to do it. So I'm gonna let them introduce themselves as they go forward and I'll introduce last. And I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Shane Tilton. Well, howdy everyone. Howdy. <laughs> there we go. Ah. It's almost like you've been here like the entire South by Southwest. That scares me a little bit. We gotta have a little energy. So my name's Shane Tilton. I'm assistant professor of multimedia journalism at Ohio Northern University. Uh, I wrote the chapter on the music of The Legend of Zelda. That's what we'll be discussing. And you might notice my little friend here. I have a little giveaway from Ohio Northern. So if you retweet something of mine, uh, you might win something. So with that being said, I'm glad to be here. I'm Dr. Emery Daniel. I am an assistant professor at Appalachian State University in the mountains of North Carolina. Happy to be here in Texas for like the second time here in the last few months, <laughs> uh, but happy to be presenting about this. I do a lot of research in streaming and streamers, uh, so it's a big fascination of mine to look into video games as well. Um, I did a chapter in the Majora's Mask with the Kubler-Ross Stages of Grief. I am Dr. Rachel Cowart. I am the research director of Take This, which is a nonprofit organization that provides mental health resources to the gaming community and the gaming industry. I actually didn't write a chapter in the book. I am an honorary author up here today uh, because Tony wrote it right after I had my baby and I did not have time. Um, but I'm happy to be here. She, she gets a break, everyone. She's a wonderful author and, and fantastic person. So my name is Dr. Anthony Bean, and I am a clinical director, uh, an executive director, clinical psychologist of the nonprofit up in Fort Worth called the Telos Project. And I train people on how to use video games and other stuff, geekery stuff, in therapeutic practice. And one of the things is what I wanted to do is give everyone up here a big round of applause because they've all come from out of state. We actually have an international person here now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. I'm Thanks. from Austin originally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a much bigger. Trying to do the native crowd. That's good. That's good, Rachel. That's good. I think you only got like a third of them, though. <laughs> That's all right. All right. So one of the big things of the psychology of Legend of Zelda, it is filled with psychology and Nintendo does a really, really good job of this and focusing on the different psychological aspects that are found within everyday life. So one of the ideas behind it is why? How do they fit this into the narrative? How do they make this so important and impactful for so many people? Whenever we have a new game come out with every three to four years, it instantly hits number one. There seems like there is no less of a, just an almost craving for new, new games. One of the reasons that we have it in the, of this aspect is because of a lot of the book chapters. But the idea that there is over 20 different games and a lot of different people are continuously buying them and they're being remade and they go up to number one again really speaks to Nintendo's ability to tell a story, a narrative outline of being able to really understand how does this impact us as individuals. We don't usually get to play with one another on these games, so this makes the game even that much more interesting. And I wanted to kind of pause it over to them a little bit of what about this game itself was so enthralling for you? Because all the chapters on the book are written by Zelda fans. If you were not a Zelda fan, you were not a, kind of allowed to write for it yeah. um, because you had to have had a love for this, this uh, idea. Okay. Well, I think I kind of rediscovered my fandom with Zelda with Breath of the Wild. And, yeah, how many Breath of the Wild fans do we have out there? Yeah. <laughs> right group, right group. The thing I liked about uh, Breath of the Wild was it was the first time that Zelda really went with an open world, a true open world environment, where you felt really engaged with the culture of Hyrule. And I think you got the hints of what Hyrule was like throughout other games. You got the hints through Ocarina of Time, you got through Majora's Mask, but that was the first time you really got the cultural deep dive interpretation of what this society is like. So 
as someone that is from the Appalachian, or was originally part from the Appalachian part of the United States, seeing this foreign land opened my eyes. And I felt immersed in this environment. They were telling me a story of a culture that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist except in the great creators of the work. And I can feel engaged with the story they're telling me. As someone that studies more communication in their research, I dig the narratives that I'm seeing. I'm digging the culture. I'm digging the rituals that I notice and participating in them, feeling active as part of the particular work. To me, Zelda has always done great with storytelling. Regardless of the version of the game that you play, that I feel that I am part of telling the story of freeing this land, using the avatar of Link to accomplish something, and gloating over Ganon when I finally defeat him. That's beautiful. That, I know, that, I put a tear in my eye. It was yeah, really, it's, it's up beautiful. Over here. It's very poetic. Okay. Um, Take it away. I, I think one of the things I like as far as the longevity of what makes this series so popular is what makes any video game popular, is how much we can immerse ourselves in it. And through communication and social psychology, they talk quite a bit, a lot about presence. So you may have heard this through a term called telepresence, but there's several major facets within presence, but two of them that really stick out are social presence um, and spatial presence. And for uh, The Legend of Zelda, for me, spatial presence is probably one of the main facets with it. Now, again, this comes back to Breath of the Wild, for instance, uh, because I feel so immersed within this world uh, that I find myself hunting for durian fruits for three hours and realize that three hours went by, um, or battling a Lionel and realizing that, again, three hours have gone by, <laughs> even though I wanted to throw my switch out the window at that point. Um, but it goes into other chapters as well, uh, where that spatial presence worked with Link's journey. and. I know as a part of myself, when I play certain versions of The Legend of Zelda, probably most of them as a matter of fact, I do feel like first and foremost, I am what Miyamoto envisioned with it is the, the young person going out and exploring caves, which is kind of how he imagined it when he first talked about it. But the other thing is that I feel like I'm on that hero's journey myself uh, and the growing and uh, earning the Triforce of Courage. That, that meant a lot to me, um, especially in terms of how I was dealing with things. So that's something that resonated with me, but also why I think it has a lot of the longevity of that it, it does for why we keep playing. For me, it's all about Zelda. I mean, the evolution of Zelda over time uh, really is part of the reason I feel like a lot of us come back. It's almost like the same stories being told. I'm, obviously, there's differences between the titles but Zelda has continued to evolve and change from the beginning to Breath of the Wild. And to me, it keeps, its change evolves and follows the same changes kind of that we have experienced in our society, like Hyrulean society mirrors our society. Um, don't wanna talk too much, but I'm gonna talk about Zelda today, so I don't wanna <laughs> gush too much yeah. on her now, but um, yeah. You're, you're definitely going to talk a lot about right. her. Um, and one of the things for me specifically was the Ocarina of Time. I can't tell you how many times I got in trouble and grounded from my parents. And when they see this uh, presentation, my mom's going to be like, yeah, all right, there was, I remember those three months at a time. There was up to one year at one point, all because of Ocarina of Time. Um, and trying to get into that Java Java's mouth little kingfish that just takes a swing time. I'm just moving over. <laughs> Parents pull into the driveway. And I'm like, oh my god, you need to go faster. Go faster. And it's just like, do 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 And then all of a sudden, they come in the door. My mom's like, and you're grounded. And I was like, he just finished. Let me save it. Nope. It's a switch, uh, and the whole system goes down. Yeah, so I think, think we're all safe to say that we're very avid uh, Zelda players here. One of the big qualities that we always like to talk about as well is the immersive qualities of it. And we've touched a little bit upon this as well, of the idea of presence. And one of the things I wanted to actually posit over to Rachel was the, the idea of immersion and what makes the game so immersive. It, you, that's not a short answer question. <laughs> um, well, we got 50 minutes, so you yeah. Might, yeah. 50 minutes and 10 yep. seconds. Okay, good. Um, there are so many elements 
to Zelda that make it immersive? The music, the environment, the story, the, what you were talking about, losing your sense of time, it engages us in a sense of flow, which is something you hear a lot in psychology because you, you enter a state of flow when the challenge of the game meets the skill of the player. That's the sense you get when you look up and it's three and you look back and you think a minute passed and five hours passed. Uh, and Zelda, with all of the elements combined within this franchise, consistently in every title that's released, um, it really just draws us in. It's everything. It's music. Come on, Shane, you could talk about the role of music. Well, I mean, the reason that I think the music is relatively immersive is because of the way it sort of sneaks itself into the game. If you think about the original game, so I need everyone to close their eyes. Come on, close your eyes. Think about the first time that you turn on, if you're all like me, you had your first NES, or the first time that you turned on a game system and you heard the overworld theme. You knew the moment you heard that dramatic chords that were progressing through the song that you're going to be dropped into this epic story. You can open your eyes, by the way. But I was thank you for letting me do that. But, <laughs> but you you knew that you were going to be in this epic story. You didn't know what role you played in the epic story, but you knew you were there. And the more that you heard this music, the more that you became that you enjoyed the music. Remembering the first time you could actually throw the sword, or the first time you went into the first dungeon of the original Legend of Zelda, you've it changed from that beautiful overworld theme to the more dramatic dungeon music. So the more that you were exposed to that, the more that you got some joy from the music you heard. And that would be the mere exposure. So there's a classic um, conditioning theory called mere exposure theory, which basically says the more that you're exposed to a piece of music or a cultural work, the more likely that you're going to have positive associations as long as your experiences were positive when you heard the music you are able to take what you like from your experiences and incorporate that into the music, which I think that definitely gets you into the immersion. I think it also gets you into sort of the presence arguments as well, mm -hmm. if you want to talk a little bit about that. Well, and I actually, because when you say that as far as enjoyment, how does that incorporate when I'm getting chased by a guardian I've, and I've had the most <laughs> stressful music that I've ever had since uh, Sonic? I picked specific pieces. Notice I didn't talk <laughs> guardian. That's a... Not that, no, Guardian's a light piece of music. What are you talking about? I'm not scared when I hear Guardian. That's, that's very joy, right? I said I was Am I playing a different game? Stress. Oh, stress, okay, yeah. that's different, okay. Yeah. okay. No, continue, continue. No. <laughs> but again, th this is another facet within presence is what can immerse us? What brings us into the game? And uh, within music, that is obviously something that uh, in, makes it so that we feel like we are someplace else. Um, and that is, uh, for video games at least, or for any type of media, uh, what, you're, what you're going for, what you're trying to accomplish is to get people immersed. Um, and so, you know, when I'm playing, for instance, like a horror game or something, the goal is to make me stressed out right. and make me tense and panicked. Uh, and so, again, uh, that's where we get a little bit within Zelda, not the horror game aspect of it. Uh, then again, you know, like I said, Guardians. Um, however, we do try to immerse ourselves in any capacity possible, whether it be um, spatial or social, uh, depending who, on who we're interacting with. And one of the big things that we did in, with this, this book is we treated it as it was our own a baby on some sense of what qualities have we always figured out uh, when we would think about this game to idealize of what gave us that immersive presence and that idea that we are super powerful as we play this game. And these are the topics that were kind of come up. The idea of projection upon the characters, the dark world shadow, triforcing the journey, which is a very entertaining uh, play on words. We have the feminism we're going to talk about a little bit today. The, it's her. <laughs> uh, the five stages of grief, which we've got him, and the uh, Music, music, which we've already stumbled into a little bit. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the other stuff as well here. So my expertise is in what we call archetypal psychology. And this basically the idea that archetypes are considered to be images, thoughts, and feelings associated with an event that have a universal meaning. So the idea of Link being a 
hero is what we'd call the heroic journey leads to what we call the heroic archetype. Now, when we play as him, he starts up as nothing. He starts up with what we call as an orphan. It's not amounting to anything. I chose this picture right here because this is his bully throughout of all of his childhood right here um, in Ocarina of Time. And when he is trying to get through, this bully is being like, no, you can't do that. You're a no fairy. You probably can't read it right there. But it says, hello there, Mr. No Fairy. You can't go past this because I'm just going to shuffle my way around back and forth and I'm going to be too fast. And even if you can find the glitch to get past me, I'm still going to find a way to get you. Um, but one of the big things is Link in all of his games starts off as what we call an orphan archetype. Is He starts off with nothing, he's lost all of his family, he has no real uh, parents to, to amount to it. And he has to traverse his journey because he has had destiny thrust upon him. And through that destiny, you have to go through the temples, the symbolism of the temples, the symbolism of the land. Breath of the Wild did an amazing job with the idea of shrines and, and brought the symbolism even further. So the idea of how we would work with this in a, a therapeutic setting, and we'll give you guys kind of a mini debriefing on this, um, is when we talk about archetypes in any sort of video game, they have to follow one of these seven different paths. And for Link specifically, he starts off as the orphan where you see him down at the bottom, and then he has to traverse through one of the seven paths of valor, either through as a warrior, ranger, or spellcaster. And depending on the way that you play, one of these is going to be a little bit more primary, secondary, than tertiary. Everyone plays the game a little bit differently. So by playing through these different archetypes, you are saving Hyrule from destruction, which leads to the hero of time. So this is what we would call an arch archetypal path of heroic uh, symbolism. And we'll lead to you on this one. All right. Let's talk about Zelda. You can't talk about the legend of Zelda without talking about the legend herself. Now, as a kid growing up playing games, um, not too many female characters to relate to. You had Princess Peach, who was very classic damsel in distress. Several years later, you had Laura Croft, who was better in the sense that she was the main protagonist, but obviously over-sexualized, and she had her own problems. Uh, but in the middle, we well, you know, in the middle we have Zelda, right? And the reason I say she's in the middle is because she has the classic princess qualities of community. She's very loving and supportive and beautiful, but she also has the qualities of agency. She makes strategic decisions. She has analytical thinking. And these are the qualities typically associated with the male hero. And she shows these qualities despite the fact that she is still set in a sexist environment. And when I say the term sexist, what I'm referring to is the idea that women are perceived to be more pure and more moral than men. And because of this, the way they can interact in society is limited. So the most obvious example would be it's called The Legend of Zelda. <laughs> and Link is the hero. That's the first uh, hint at that. Um, also, the way people speak to her, the way people speak to Link about her. You must protect her. It's too dangerous. Uh, but Zelda rebukes this. Even from the very beginning, in the very first title, she breaks the Triforce of Wisdom. She shows agency. She makes a decision. And this has only continued to evolve over time. In Osarina, there's Sheik, of course. Um, Zelda is the one who decides when is the time to dispatch the Hero of Time. In Breath of the Wild, she has pants. We have come a long way from the, <laughs> <laughs> from the very first one, right? And what I love about her evolution is not only one of the things I love very much about the franchise, is that, as I mentioned before, it mirrors the evolution in our society. So in the late 80s, of course, there were women in the workforce, there were female engineers, but you fast forward to today and it's the norm. There are female game developers, that's not an exception, that's the norm. There are female astronauts, it's normal. Um, and how it mirrors the psychology of our evolution in Hyrule, I think is one of the reasons why it's so beloved equally among male and female gamers alike, uh, and why we keep coming back to the same story uh, because it touches something in our own story. But I also think that Nintendo does a really good job of staying w and mirroring where we are in society. Yes. And I yes. think that as we continue going forward, what do you, th what do you think is going to actually happen? Yeah, I think that she's going to continue to evolve. And what's so interesting is that you don't see it in other princess roles. Yeah. Like, I can't think of princess another. Princess Peach hasn't yet. 
Princess Peach what? We haven't seen her evolve. Right, evolve. It's the same classic damsel in distress. And, you know, the um, Anita her. Sarkeesian talks a lot about, you know, the way that the female characters tend to be pigeonholed. And Zelda is one of the few, there are others, but one of the few, at least in the princess role, uh, that rebukes this, this pigeonholing. Well, even if you look at going sort of outside the series, if you look at something like Super Smash Brothers, the way she is represented in that game is more towards the warrior class. If you, look, if you play Peach or if you play Daisy, it's more of a traditional right. defensive role. Right. So she has sort of broken that bond and that traditional representation very effectively. Yeah. She's awesome. We like Zelda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the big things in, uh, Stephen already kind of talked a little bit about this, is playing through the game, you are playing a literal representation of what we call the heroic journey. And as you are defeating bosses, taking down shrines, reclaiming Hyrule for the, the people, you have to overcome not just your own stuff, but the land as well, which is a call to, to help out the land of uh, the people of Hyrule, to be able to focus in on the content of what is needed, what does it mean to be a hero. And there are a lot of steps to this. Um, we will definitely be honest with you on that. We don't have time to get to all of them because there are a ton and it would take a long time. Um, but basically, the, the reason that the hero's journey is so important to uh, Legend of Zelda is because as you're playing through Link, you have to project, and we'll get to that one in a second too, upon Link and on some aspect, when you shut the game down, you have to reclaim that type of projection. So one of the things I wanted to give to these guys right here is how did they feel the heroic journey when they played Zelda? I, I think the, when I traditionally think of a hero's journey, I think of the classic English approach to the hero's journey primarily. And it feels that, unlike other games of the time, I'm going to back to the original Legend of Zelda because that's where I feel the strongest pull to this. It seems to me that it gave you more capability to feel that loss. You were trying to... It's... You, you felt that you were trying to recapture some sort of pathway in glory, even though the story and the narrative wasn't as explicit in the original game. You were kind of piecemealing it as you went along. But the more that you learned about it, the more that you felt that you were basically being set up for this grandiose final battle, and therefore making your mark on this land. To me, that journey means that you are making the time and the effort through your experiences through the nine dungeons to make a mark. You learn new things. And the beautiful thing about the way that was written from the original game is you got the pieces along the way. So when I need to get a raft to make it to the next dungeon, it was given to me. If I need to essentially, um, if I need to have a stronger weapon to get to the point where I can be successful, that comes along as well. It's using the journey and using the tools within the game to tell this really effective story of ways of improving myself. And you can apply that in the real world, that you see as you are facing your challenges and facing your demons, that you observe the tools that you use to survive and cope and adjust to those experiences. To me, that's the telling part. And, and what you were talking about is uh, the individual monomyth hero, heroic um, ideology behind that, is we all have our own personal myth, and we all have to follow our own personal myth. And when we tap into that, we become powerful. And when we are that powerful, we feel like we can do nothing, nothing wrong. And we have to then use that energy appropriately in order to overcome our difficulties that are happening in real life in a lot of different areas. I, you know, when I think about this in terms of the hero's journey, and this may go along with your idea within being orphaned, mm -hmm. uh, I look at post-traumatic uh, growth. And I think this is an instance where, you know, since... Link is an outcast. I'm kind of leaning towards Ocarina of Time on this one. Since Link is an outcast, this is the part where he has to grow. Um, now, granted, he is found out within almost the first act that, oh, by the way, you are some hero, and you're going to have to save Hyrule. No pressure. No. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just what you do. Yeah, that's what you do. BT dubs, go into your, uh, your father's body and kill this spider. <laughs> <laughs> but th that is some of the areas that I like about Legend of Zelda. First and foremost, within uh, post-traumatic growth literature, uh, one of the things they tell is 
to make sure you're active, make sure you're going out to place to place and trying to be involved, be engaged. Um, and obviously, Link does that. Well, he kind of has to. Um, but you know, the, the challenges get harder and harder, as any video game does. Um, but the other thing is he, and this is the second part of it, he meets a lot of people along the way. I mean, you think of the Seven Sages within uh, Ocarina of Time. They are the friends that helps him through this journey. And through post-traumatic growth, that is an essential part of, again, literature that uh, supports this. If you've gone through trauma, people matter and your friends matter. And so having that support system to guide you along the way uh, makes a big difference. And so that's a major uh, concept within psychology of that hero's journey. And with those support systems, though, you would never have had them had you not ventured outside. You challenge yourself. There's a saying in psychology we like to say is you have to be comfortably uncomfortable enough to move. And I think that is what this game series usually does a really good job of it. It's making you just comfortable enough so you feel like you can do it, but uncomfortable enough so it forces you to move on. I do. I had I had a good friend that told me that um, it, it helps within the hero's journey that Link gets up and is active because he was like, Link's kind of lazy. <laughs> because almost every game you start out with, what is he doing when he first starts up? Sleeping. Yeah. So, and I, I kind of probably endorse that a little too much because I'm either fishing or uh, hitting chickens with my sword. Then running Which, inside to reset. Yeah, 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 so anyway. Well, the other thing about that last question, how is the player actually playing out the journey? You talk about this in the book, I don't remember which chapter it was, but um, pointing out the fact that Link has no dialogue and the point is so the player can project themselves onto Link. Link is very androgynous in his appearance and those design choices make a big impact in connecting yourself as the hero, as Link, going through the journey. Absolutely. And it's yeah. developing your own dialogue because yeah. where he's silent, you are basically trying to superimpose a narrative that makes sense based on where you perceive to um, the story. I know there was someone that was cosplaying as Link and I told him about the panel and they just said, huh! as a way of reacting. Uh, oh, yeah, hi, hey. Yeah. So, so, it, so, so it is a way of creating the hero's journey and more customized. So it's not just even the projection, it's that it's narrative construction within yeah. that game story, which, is, which makes it really compelling. Absolutely. And one of the big things that we like to play around with is the idea is Link can be a really important uh, model for psychological healing. We've talked a little bit about the PTSD and how when someone is, is traumatized or goes through a traumatic experience, they have the chance to either fight, flight, or freeze. And the wonderful thing about the Legend of Zelda uh, series is that you have that option too, but you don't take it. And so it kind of teaches us different ways of handling the experience, handling these other areas of that can uh, be superimposed upon our own lives that maybe something's really difficult. Maybe it's hard for us to get up in the morning or maybe that we, it's really hard for us to engage that bully at school. Link itself can be used in that capacity through the journey. And this is one of the games that I always make my um, foster children play because it activates a lot of the uh, orphan archetype but also their ability to understand themselves is just because they are locked in that doesn't mean that they can't be someone, that they can't become something better. If anything, it's about using your strengths to your benefit. How have you guys kind of used this as a, as a weapon against mental health uh, difficulties? I, I think it teaches me to be more mindful, and I'm gonna go to Breath of the Wild. The thing that I appreciate most about Breath of the Wild is that it doesn't force the player to listen to the background music the entire time. It is extremely effective in using natural sounds and being mindful of your environment. Now granted, it, part of that is also a defense mechanism that if I start hearing changes to the, to the sound, I'm gonna be more aware and it might be more present, which go into fight or flight mode. But I think it's, it's just beautiful because if you are in the middle of a plane, just out of any of the cities, any of the villages, and you just sit there, and you listen to the grass go. Or if you're in the outside the edge of a woods, you can hear the leaves blow. So 
one of the things that I do appreciate, I appreciate, I don't practice as often as I should, is the idea of breathing and the idea of just trying to take the moment for what it is. So, I, I, and this is part of the confession, I don't do as much of the practice, I don't do the therapeutic components, but as a, per, as a point of self-care, it reminded me to take more of an advantage of that. I think one element that I like the most about this, and, that, and this gets always into Majora's Mask, that's one of my personal favorites, and also one of the ones that I wrote the chapter on, um, is we've no been, bias, no bias, no bias at all. No. He, he picked Breath of the Wild. Why can't I pick one? <laughs> um, <I'm, yeah. laughs> this was actually a conversation of the times that we've done this panel. You know, we usually get to talk to uh, people in the audience about some of the games and how it might have affected their life. And one thing that was really cool for me on several occasions somebody talked to me about Majora's Mask and said, this is actually a way that it helped me get over the death of my mother. And I, <laughs> I was, I just stopped. Yeah. I, I didn't realize how much there could be an impact on there because they would sit there and go, some of the trials that someone was going through, so especially uh, going through the Zora domain, it is such a depressing place, um, especially for like Lulu who lost her children. Um, they would sit there and say, I felt that. I felt this void that I, was able, I wasn't able to escape. And so getting to the, this is one of the things that she mentioned to me. She was like, getting to the moon was actually not only a huge accomplishment, but it was my acceptance. It was my getting out of this, what I'll explain later, is a, a distorted reality. Uh, and Majora's Mask is a distorted reality through the, out, out the entirety of the game. So uh, again, I, I think there are lessons uh, to be learned here in terms of how the narrative drives uh, some of the facets within our own lives. Let's talk about the Wind Waker, because I feel like <laughs> we're not talking about that enough. Um, I'm a big fan generally of projective assessment, and I think that with maybe the exception of Majora, as I mentioned, The Legend of Zelda is very good at you superimposing yourself in the role of the hero. And I'm just curious as to how people generally spend their time in the game. Are they following the narrative? Are they chasing chickens? Are they fishing? Um, and the different iterations of The Legend of Zelda allow you to explore in this way. And you don't have to just follow the narrative um, all the way through from start to finish. Yeah, you can literally control your own destiny on yeah. some level in there, which is fantastic through a linear lens of uh, how video games are usually created these yeah. days. Oh boy, now we get to talk to the positive side <laughs> of, which by the way, you give me a lot of macabre topics. <laughs> I do. To write about. You're just uh, so he, good he gets at it music. though. Yeah. Um, he gets, and he gets empowerment I, I, I feminism. I like fluffy and, things, what can I tell you? That's and I get death, <laughs> and the next <laughs> chapter I'm gonna write is about cults. So <laughs> what, I, what, what does that say about me? My goodness. Right. Um, you agreed I to it. I can tell you what that says about yeah, I, I think we have <laughs> Good seeing entire, everybody. Once again, it's been real. Entire discussion I'll about see y'all later. Uh, <laughs> I love this chapter. Uh, we wrote, uh, myself, a uh, psychologist by the name of Carrie Shepard and Larissa Garski wrote this chapter together and we were equal parts just so ready to tackle this. I was actually fresh off a of publication about the kubler Ross stages of grief. I was going through Twitter over a long sp span of time and seeing how people reacted to a certain Game of Thrones character. Uh, I have to say certain because I spoiled it once in my office. Do not spoil it. And per it's the study, this actually, this actually matched the study. They went to depression right away. As in, this person started crying in my office right away. And which character is this? I can't say. <sighs> they may not be caught up. Okay. Why, why was the switching to depression so impactful? So, the reason is, <laughs> you may have been familiar with this fan theory that the Kula Ross stages of grief, first and foremost, who's heard of the Kula Ross stages of grief? Okay. So, quite a few people in here, I'm, I'm gonna do a small refresher course on it. Um, you're dealing with five different stages from Elizabeth Kubler Ross, uh, which are denial, anger, um, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And the model is that each one of these stages maps with one of the places in Termina. So uh, when you were to look at denial, that was Clock Town. Yep. Because most of the carpenters 
didn't even know who you were. They didn't even think the world needed saving at all. They were in complete denial of everything that was going on. Uh, then you go into anger. Uh, if you go to the Deku Palace, the Deku King gets mad at the monkey and is how upset he is for kidnapping his daughter, which obviously is wrongfully accused. And we see that quite a bit. Denial uh, is short-lived, but anger can last a long time. Uh, same with bargaining. With, in Snowhead, Darmani begs you, please bring back my soul, um, which that is also reminiscent of what we know about the stages of grief, is that we look for a higher power. Save someone in my life. Um, it may be a deity, it may be a doctor, that kind of thing. Uh, I already mentioned about depression within Great Bay, very depressing place. Uh, again, and Lulu is the case study that goes along with that. Uh, and then acceptance, we kind of looked at Ikata Valley, which this is probably one of my favorite ones because when we talk about acceptance, everybody thinks, oh, everything's good now. No, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross made sure to say, everything's not great when you reach acceptance. She actually lists it specifically as a void of emotions. It just is come to the realization of what has just happened. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about death. So as we see the loss of Navi, it was the loss. It wasn't necessarily a death of, but you can have the, you can go through the Kubla Rasa stages of grief through many different facets of your life that you feel trauma in. Um, and acceptance, again, is my personal favorite stage. One, it's because it's the most positive one uh, of all of them, even though, again, it is a void of emotions. But the thing I like about it most, it lifts a shroud of what we know as that distorted view. Because when you get the Deku mask, which is another part of our chapter, we talk about masks of the Kubla Ross model, which is really cool. Carrie Shepard came up with that idea, and we just ran with it. The Deku mask represents the I have got to get out of this state immediately. Because when you get the Deku mask, what do you do? It's, it's three days, you need to get that mask off. That's your goal. So afterwards, everything else though is distorted. The same characters exist from Majora's Mask as they do the Ocarina of Time. It's just a bit different. They have different roles, they have different dialogue, they react to you differently. Again, you are not, you're no longer the hero of time anymore. Again, they barely register your presence in many cases. And so that, when we get into the moon, for instance, we get out of that distorted view. view. And I think my favorite scene in Majora's Mask is the, the end, where Link is riding off on Little Epona. And it's not the same ending that it was from Ocarina of Time, where there's fireworks and celebration. No, he's riding off in the distance by himself, with his head down, no less. Again, acceptance is not happiness. It is that void. Um, and it's a somber yet beautiful ending to that game. A very sad game, but a very fun game as well. I, and very appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and so the different masks that you collect through Majora's Mask all have a significance and a meaning behind the, the, the players, the interactions with your environments, and it all has a very important part to play. Some of them you have to spend all three days getting. Some of them you get really quick. We were going to have them do an interpretive dance up here, but we voted against it. <laughs> um, Nobody wants to see me dance. He said he wasn't going to get a mask yeah. for it. So Yeah. Shame. I, I need rewards here. So the idea behind uh, Link uh, in his personal shadow is we all have an, uh, a personal shadow ourselves. And it is deep down, rooted really deep within us, and it's not something that we can really get at very quickly. The wonderful thing that Nintendo does on with Link in his uh, personal shadow is he literally has to fight it on a lot of the games. But one of the big things that also is important from a psychoanalytical point of view is that Link's shadow will not just engage with him on his own. You as the player are the one that has to engage Link first. You have to draw your sword first which is very symbolic of how we, as individual people, have to battle our own shadow. Is If we don't personally engage with it, if we don't take it and say, hey, I'm gonna brandish my sword and shield and let's fight, it's never gonna go away. You're never gonna hit the acceptance, you're never gonna hit the cleansing. One of the ideas behind this, uh, as we see it through the games, is the shadow represents that darker self of Link. And that darker self is something that he has to accept. And by accepting it, he then can go for, uh, forward. 
in when we go through the different cleansing stages of our own personal shadow, our own personal worth, that's when we have to fight this shadow overall. And kind of going into the shadows, I think the one thing that we can observe is sort of how the music sort of frames the darkness and the light within the different games. Um, the one thing that I really appreciate about the music of Legend of Zelda is they use a really effective technique. So Kondo, who is the uh, composer of most of the games of Legend of Zelda except for the Breath of the Wild, uses a very traditional letmost approach. How many uh, music majors do we have? Or how many people have studied music? Okay, okay, so I've got to go over it. So a letmost <laughs> is basically a musical representation of a character. So if you think about the overworld theme from the original Legend of Zelda, you have this sort of wonderful string-based melody that keeps appearing. And they do it effectively in other games. So in the, and I say Ocarina of Time, Ocarina of Time, I guess, I guess there's kind of variations, but. Potato, in, in, potato. Yeah, I know. So it, it, it's used in Ocarina of Time, it's used in A Link to the Past, it is used in, um, it's even used a little bit in Breath of the Wild towards the earlier stages of the game. But you hear these melodies that keep calling you back. And therefore, it does really effective in just framing the story within the narrative of the music within the narrative of the story. Um, there's another set of theories I like to use that's called Gestalt theory, that basically the sum is more, or the, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So the way that music is incorporated within the game, it is just a piece. But if you miss that piece of music, it loses the overall messaging of what those narratives allow you to be able to remember, to be able to play, and to be able to enjoy. And I talked a little bit about this earlier in terms of leaving those impressions, that uh, the mere exposure effect helps you with that. But I think the one thing that gives you an imprint, that does the best um, job of showing the ways that music imprints a particular impression or experience in your memory is going back to the Guardian's music you hear in Breath of the Wild. And I kid, it is a very industrial style of music. It's harsh overturns, it's more modern and futuristic in comparison to the softer music you would have through the rest of the game. But what it invokes is it's part of your media training. That you, if you hear music like that in other shows or if you hear it in movies, you know something bad is going to happen. You don't need to be told under nine, there's a monster coming for you. You hear it. It's much like if you think about um, Halloween, when you hear those ripped tones as uh, Michael Myers comes through the closet. You don't need to be told that there's gonna be something bad happening. You hear that music. Legend of Zelda does that really effectively. And the other thing that I think is really cool about the music is that there are these cultural overtones that are absorbed in the real world. How many of you have attended a Symphony of the Goddess concert? Think, so for those that have not attended, it is a orchestral representation of the songs of Legend of Zelda, but it's more than that. It's a cultural experience. You see the symbols of Hyrule in the different shows that you're at, or you see the people um, Ex adopting the different mannerisms of the characters within the game. And that's it's taken to really the extreme measure, or not extreme measure, but it's taken to its logical conclusion with Taylor Davis. Now, how many of you have seen Taylor Davis's videos on YouTube? So yeah. for those not familiar with Taylor Davis, she is a violinist that basically replicates the music of Legend of Zelda, and she adopts the mannerisms, she adopts the costuming, and she becomes essentially a cultural ambassador to Hyrule. So even if you've never traveled to Hyrule, the way that she particularly frames her shots, the mezzan scene, if you will, gives you an appreciation. So all of these pieces of, of, of all these topics that I'm discussing gets to one point, that basically the music is the cultural legacy of Hyrule. It's telling the story of a location that has never existed except in the shared social experiences of the minds of the players. Very well put, man. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Like, I'm I don't so know where to go with that. I'm, 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 I'm yeah. enthralled. So wait a minute, so yeah. I just cut everything off. Okay. <laughs> well, we got 15 minutes. I mean, so yeah. if, you, if you ever get a chance to, to look, go and find Taylor Davis's do uh, it. work, yeah. it's hands down fantastic. And she doesn't just do The Legend of Zelda. She does um, Final yeah. Fantasy. Yeah. She does um, anime characters. She is fantastic. 
So uh, with that point, we always like to make sure that there are questions that are always having, happening in everyone's mind, but we also want to make sure that we can kind of answer anything since we kind of help write these chapters and have an idea of where we can kind of help maybe with some flow issues or something like that. So we wanted to open up the last 15 minutes here for any sort of questions that any, anyone may or may not have. And then also I believe we're going to be over at the meet and greet afterwards. So there's a mic in the beginning or beginning. Middle. Here, close to us. Yeah. Center. Closer to the stage, closer to the stage. I can almost reach it. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and go ahead. Okay. Have you ever covered anything from Twilight Princess in the book yet? I believe that we did talk a little bit about uh, Twilight Princess and with Midna's in the idea of uh, the wolf uh, archetype and what it doesn't mean to be animalistic, then regain your humanity. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Hello. Um. So. I. I wanted to bring up the subject of. I I've had an autoimmune disorder since I was about eight. Um. And so, you know, what that is, is your immune system attacks your body right. um, in ways that it should, it, it just basically malfunctions and tries to self-destruct. Um, and because of that, I have, you know, spent a lot of time in hospitals and I have uh, had trouble walking because um, my left leg is crippled. Um, I, I have had to walk with a cane um, at certain times of my life. Um, and... I feel like, for me, Link really embodies the sort of of courage in, in taking on your opponents or your foes or whatever it is that you're struggling with because it doesn't matter how, how great the obstacle is, he always seems to like, to, to face it with a certain with a certain faith and with a certain acceptance of the circumstances. And that has, I've been playing Zelda since I was a little kid. I think my first game was Twilight Princess. I've also played Wind Waker, um, Skyward Sword, and Breath of the Wild. And I just, every, every time that I play, I feel that, that. That, that pull? That, yeah, that sense that, you know, that sense of the courage and the, the whole hero, you know, of being, of, of being powerful, like you said, um, of being, of being able to fight circumstances. Um, so I just... I think that that's a very, I don't know, that wasn't really a question. <laughs> well, let, let, me, let me phrase it a little bit for you. So what, what you're talking about is the courage and the idea that that's one of the Triforce pieces. Now we also have wisdom and we have power. Now we know that power can corrupt if it's underneath the, the wrong circumstances and it's the only uh, part of the Triforce that you have. So you have to have the courage and you have to have the wisdom in order to hold the power because those are the two bottom parts of it. So I think that kind of what you're talking about is your courage that you're feeling is you're gaining wisdom on some level that is giving you the power to continue to fight, which is beautiful. Yeah. Hard to follow that one up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, it seems like a, a lot of your analysis has to do with the, the general like crafting of stories and tapping into the human psyche like in a way that every story in theory would attempt to and I, I would expect that uh, such like a cash cow for such a major organ uh, corporation would definitely tap into that. Um, I was wondering like for each of you like um, what is unique to the Zelda franchise that other stories do not do or that you think it does exceptionally well? I think to me what makes Zelda to me really compelling is more it's it's telling the prince's story in a way that hasn't been told before. I'm going to go with what Rachel said. To me, it's a different relationship. So I feel that 
you're not getting a tropic representation. And as you said, Nintendo could have just simply told the story over and over again. I think the thing that I appreciate more about Zelda than other games is that it's these easy, it's this, these slight enough variations on themes that I feel like I'm getting a new telling story. It's not like Zelda's, or you're not getting Link's origin story every time you play. It's not like the big superhero movie that I, I no, I don't need to see Link re, being reborn over again. It's variations of that, which is really interesting, but it's, it's the change in the story that I find really compelling that other games just don't do. I actually bring this up to um, how relatable Link is in many ways. This was the area of uh, some really cool pop literature that talked about why we enjoy Batman versus Superman. Yeah. yeah. And the idea was is Batman has no powers. And he's relatable in that way to so technically saying that, now granted I don't have billions of dollars. I was gonna but say that's he's the really power, rich. But it, yeah. I don't have powers either, so technically I could do that. And Link does not start off all powerful because that's boring. It's uninteresting. Um, he has to gain that through courage and so forth. And so that's probably one of the reasons it stands out for me. That and it's probably the best embodiment of the hero's journey. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's you. The evolution again, you starting out with no power and then becoming the hero. And also the way in which they create him, like I was saying earlier, that you can project on him. Uh, my favorite series ever, I'm a Final Fantasy kind of girl. Um, and that's totally different because you're interacting with groups, you're manipulating how the group interacts. But with The Legend of Zelda, you, f you are the hero. You feel like whether you're a girl or a boy, a man or a woman, young or old, they make him androgynous and mysterious enough that everyone can feel like this is me and I am going on this journey. And remember, when you shut that, that game off, you have to reclaim that projection. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons why Nintendo makes him so he doesn't talk, and he's yeah. androgynous enough so he's, all sorts of people can project upon him. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. you. You talk about the hero's journey a lot and all that, but I wanted to hear what you thought about Link's Awakening, which doesn't necessarily follow that same thing to, to that, the same degree. That what? Link's Awakening, oh. which doesn't follow it. Um, I'm gonna let you all take because that's I haven't played it enough, so that's I, it's new. It's one that was I skipped unfortunately, so I've got to let you all say say a little bit more about why it doesn't follow it. Like all, like most of the other games, are like at, Link has to defeat the great evil and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. but Link's Awakening is a little bit different, where like basically his main goal is to go up to the mountain and wait, awaken the windfish. Absolutely. Let me ask you the question a little differently. What's not heroic about that? I mean, I'm not saying it's not heroic. I'm saying it's a different take on it. I want to see. Absolutely. It. So, so one of the beautiful things about the the heroic journey is it doesn't have to just follow what we see a lot of like Star Wars videos or or um, in the other video games. It can have a different path. the The main part of the hero's journey is made up of the seven different uh, compromises of being having the calling refusing the call, going towards the call, becoming powerful, going to the underworld, and then completing the major task that can be considered anything that could be heroic. So I, I like that you brought it up, that the heroic journey doesn't have to just follow this very simplistic mindset that a lot of games try to make a push into, in a sense, is that there can be a different variations, different spin-offs of it, but the end result still is a heroic undertaking of a task that is there to have a saving uh, portion of something within the world. Does that thank make you. sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Great question. Uh, hi, thank you for doing such a great talk. Um, I wanted to ask, it seemed like it's way overdue to have a female protagonist in a Zelda game. Yes. yes. And uh, I would like to ask... <laughs> All of us are going to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> what, what sort of themes and ideas would you like to see in a game like that? Oh, God. I mean, where to start? I, big, I, I would like to question. see like Link like not be able to be... Uh, played at all and yeah. to see what uh, Zelda would have to do to break the chains of uh, Princess Royalty and be like, I'm going to get rid of this whole royalties thing and then start from nothing. That's what I would like to see. Or it's wow. taken away from her. So I think it's something where you no longer have the Hyrule Castle. Basically, almost not that she's an orphan, but that basically she's building her skills based on what's around her. So. What I would like to see, I think more of structure, so more of a skills tree or decision tree that reinforces that 
she doesn't have that type of, she doesn't have the support of the past. She's making her way in Hyrule in a way that has not been explored before and allowing us to use skills that can take advantage of that. Well, we start to see that in Breath of the Wild when she has yeah, a yeah. research journal yeah. and you can you can actually go and find it and read it. And it's actually, in my opinion, starting to, yeah. to we're, I think they're playing with the idea. So it may not be this next one, but I think in a couple ones we Scientist might get something. Scientist Zelda, I'm into that. Oh, I know, I'd be into that too. You have to make cool awesome. potions and stuff. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, do you be believe that each Zelda game has their own different interpretations of, of psychology? And if so, can you give, give out some examples? I like how you guys just look over here. I think yep. that they, uh, yeah, yeah. they all use the same overarching themes, yeah. I would say. Um, they're just, maybe their focus is changes from title to title, uh, like Majora's Mask is slightly more into possibly stages of grief and transformation. Um, Versus Twilight Princess right. would be the repress, repress right. self or, or a repression of indigenous people. Right. So I think that one of the, the aspects of Legend of Zelda is that they, no matter what game you play, there is going to be a psychological component to it. It's about understanding it at the end of the game though because you're not going to be able to really see it uh, how it develops unless you play the game itself and then you can start putting these pieces together all right um th thanks for your time absolutely thank, thank you. you hi this has been a great hi. panel and i'm really excited to be here um i was kind of wondering it's you know one of the things is so many of the zelda games do take place in hyrule and i guess my question was kind of what do you think the significance of the ones that take place outside of Hyrule, uh, mainly like, you know, Termina being such a weird, almost like the upside down of Hyrule? Like, what do y'all think the significance the of... the best analogy. <laughs> it's, uh -huh. it's a weird, weird place, and, you know, it kind of gives a, like, fish out of water feel to it being Link, and I was kind of curious what y'all thought of Termina as a place or, you know, the other sort of areas that Zelda takes place of in Hyrule. I'd, I'd almost chalk that back up to uh, the distorted reality because you know we're dealing in a world that is completely separate from high rule and it is very much i'm like using the stranger things analogy here it is the upside down where everything is depressed and i like the fact that within termina again you as link are not the hero of time you are practically invisible and it is reflected within the world that you're in it's it's a pretty lonely environment where um, whereas in other titles, I feel like it's more the exploration and the other one, and, and Termina, for instance, it's sad and somber. Most, I mean, a lot of the people are dead. Um, you know, we were talking about the <laughs> interpretive dance mask now, <laughs> uh, I guess we're calling it. Um, you're, you're visiting a ghost. Um, Icona Valley is filled with that. And so I think there is something to be said about that distorted reality and how it attributes to growth based on the loss of Na uh, Navi. Well, and to piggyback off that, you don't have agency. Mm -hmm. It's not even that yeah. you, it's, you're invisible, but you really have no, you have very limited incentive to be part of that environment. To me, I always think that it's more of a, the Terminus is basically a way to retell cultural stories. It isn't. It is definitely a way that it's a person that's playing in that particular environment doesn't have as many actions. They're not as concerned, so they have to be more thoughtful in the actions that they take in that particular area. Well, in an Icona Valley, you actually are playing with gravity up there, too, so it's almost like you're trying to turn everything right side up again. I almost wonder how much it's based on the temples more than it is Termina itself because of, you know, the stone uh, temple. Again, all of that is reflected in, in death and... Um, effigies almost of the the selves that you had um as you play uh what is it, the effigy of emptiness was that the song if, yeah. if memory yeah. serves correctly yes. that you're creating statues of yourself and so and that that doesn't exist in any zelda game except for that one right. um so yeah i think there's something to be said about that world building uh and, and that thematic analysis of it and it gave the opportunity to add that particular cultural piece of information that music sure. is yeah it's not anywhere else so therefore it's something that adds to the cultural significance yeah awesome thank y'all thank, thank you. you so we only have 30 seconds left on our timer so we are going to be right over there um and we'll answer any questions at all for for anyone else that has anything going forward okay uh, we want to thank you all for coming yes, this has been fantastic so we love talking about these things